The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leslie McGee with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to today's presentation, Using Standardized Tools in APS Case Management and Supervision, being presented by Rachel Lakin, Maxine Stevenson, Zach Tarver, and Melissa Vongsi. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I want to share a little bit of information about the APS TARC. We are a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide, please. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC. We work with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on the use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. We're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. Next slide, please. The APS TARC works with the National Adult Protective Services Association to represent monthly peer, I'm sorry, to present monthly peer-to-peer -peer calls. These calls provide a forum for workers, supervisors, and managers and administrators to dialogue and share ideas with each other about the issues and concerns facing APS programs today. The calls are held the second, third, or fourth Wednesday of each month, depending on which peer group you want to attend. The registration information is sent via the APS listserv each month. Please email us if you are not a listserv member and would like to receive the registration information. Next slide, please. A copy of today's slides are available under the handout section in your GoToWebinar control panel and can be downloaded from there. Please use computer speakers to access audio for this webinar and adjust your volume accordingly. If you experience audio problems during the presentation, we recommend that you sign out of the we webinar and re-enter. Next slide, please. Everyone is muted for this webinar. Please put any questions or comments in the questions box and they will be relayed to our speakers during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the web at a later date. We will notify all attendees via email when it has been posted online. Everyone attending today will receive an email in approximately 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to launch a quick poll to get a feel for the makeup of our audience. You can vote by clicking directly on your screen and making the selection that best corresponds to the profession you identify with. I'm going to keep this open for a little while, let people respond. Okay, we're getting response coming in. So just select whatever it is you feel you are most represents you professionally. And I'm going to give it just another couple of seconds here. Okay. And I am going to close the poll and show you all the responses. So it looks like the majority of people on with us today are adult protective services professionals with a few other social services professionals and legal people. That's an interesting mix. And now I'm going to go back to our presentation. Next slide, please. As I noted, we have a large slate of speakers today, so I will have them all introduce themselves as they present. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Melissa Bongsi and allow her to introduce herself. Thank you, Leslie. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Melissa Bongsi, and I'm a program consultant for the Adult Protection Unit at the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Minnesota's Vulnerable Adult Protection System is county administered and state supported in which counties in the state work in partnership to protect vulnerable adults. Counties provide adult protective services and investigate allegations of alleged maltreatment when appropriate. The state operates the Minnesota Adult Abuse Reporting Center, which we refer to as MARC, Minnesota's statewide centralized common entry point. In addition, the state sets statewide standards 
and promotes statewide consistency and person-centered outcomes for vulnerable adults. Next slide, please. Since 2013, Minnesota Adult Protective Services Agencies have been required by statute to use standardized tools in response to reports referred to the agency as the lead investigative agency or for adult protective services. The use of standardized tools support policy goals of preventing further maltreatment and safeguarding vulnerable adults as they support APS in making critical decisions to carry out duties to assess and offer emergency and continuing protective services. The tools are used at critical points for decision-making in emergency adult protective services intake, lead investigative agency intake, report response priority, intake of APS requests by another lead investigative agency, assessing current safety of the vulnerable adult, assessing the strengths and needs of a vulnerable adult, and primary support persons. It guides safety planning, it assists in developing a safety plan, and reassessing the vulnerable adult's current safety to guide case closure. Next slide, please. When a report is made to Mark, every reporter is asked safety questions to identify a possible need for emergency protective services, which we refer to as EPS. If EPS is indicated on a report referred to the county agency, the report is screened using the EPS standardized intake tool. The tool determines whether the EPS report referred meets agency criteria for EPS response by APS. The tool is completed as soon as possible, but no later than 24 hours from the agency receiving the MARC EPS notification or the request for EPS from another lead investigative agency. The tool screens based on vulnerable adult status. Is the person a VA? Is the allegation reported maltreatment? based on Minnesota statute definitions, and imminent harm. Do conditions exist that could result in serious injury, serious harm, loss of health, or death to the vulnerable adult? Once completed, the supervisor reviews and approves or denies the screening decision. The tool options selected provide a basis for supervisors to review screening decisions with workers that results in APS assessment and services for vulnerable adults in the need of immediate intervention. Next slide, please. When a report is received by a county agency, decisions to accept reports for adult protective services and investigation are made using the intake assessment tool. Counties are allowed under statute to override policy screening by applying established screening prioritization guidelines. The intake assessment is to be initiated as soon as possible when the information is received but no later than one business day from receiving the report from Mark, with an intake decision to be completed no later than five business days from receiving the report. Intake activity results in a decision to open or not open a Mark referral for APS and investigation. The screening decision can be overridden by either a state approved policy override or county discretionary override. If the screening decision is to open the referral for APS and investigation, the agency may choose to use a state policy override if the referral is a duplicate and has already been screened, or if it is a duplicate referral that has already been investigated. Agencies have authority under state statute to establish screening prioritization and may use a county-based discretionary override to screen out a referral. Both policy and discretionary overrides are collected in the state data system. In addition, it determines how quickly to initiate adult protective services, 24 or 72 hours. These are referred to as level one and level two response priorities. Once completed, the supervisor is to review and approve or deny the decision. The fields selected and the overrides entered provide a basis of discussion for APS supervisors and intake screeners to evaluate the screening decision, decision and response priority to support safety of the vulnerable adult. Next slide, please. Once a report is accepted and open for emergency protective services or adult protective services and investigation, APS completes an initial safety assessment at the first face-to-face -face contact with the vulnerable adult. 
During COVID-19, assessments may have been conducted remotely. The initial safety assessment helps assess whether the vulnerable adult is likely to be in danger of serious harm. It assists in determining what interventions will provide appropriate protection. It is a basis for APS to engage with the vulnerable adult in an interview to identify their values and what is important to them regarding general safety and current danger factors identified. Assists in developing a safety plan with the vulnerable adult and the primary support person that addresses what is important to the vulnerable adult and important for their safety. The components the assessment looks at are factors influencing vulnerability, current danger factors, immediate interventions and safety decisions. The assessment includes, is the vulnerable adult in immediate danger of serious harm? What interventions are recommended to address threats to safety? And based on the vulnerable adult and the support person's acceptance of interventions, what is the safety decision? The assessment helps provide a basis for person-centered planning for vulnerable adults and support persons and can help clarify the role of adult protective services for the vulnerable adult. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, thank you. Another tool is the Strength and Needs Assessment and Reassessment, which is done concurrently with the initial safety assessment. The tool systematically identifies critical client and primary support person service needs and helps guide service planning. It ensures that all workers consistently consider each strength and need of the vulnerable adult and the primary support person if applicable. In an objective format when assessing need for services, it provides an important service planning reference for workers and supervisors, and it serves as a mechanism for monitoring service referrals made to address identified problems and as a basis for safety planning. This ensures plans are based on assessed needs and strengths. Completing this assessment with the vulnerable adult's primary support person assists the worker in identifying if the support person is able and willing to meet the vulnerable adult's needs, can obtain resources, can problem solve if additional needs emerge, and if the relationship is supportive between the primary support person and the vulnerable adult, and the support person is not financially dependent on the vulnerable adult. Next slide, please. A safety plan must be completed for all vulnerable adults, which are identified in the safety assessment as conditionally safe or unsafe. The safety plan incorporates the recommended safety interventions from the safety assessment and the priority needs identified in the strength and needs assessment. The safety plan is a tool that assists engaging the vulnerable adult and support person. The supervisor reviews and approves or denies the plan and once approved, it is shared with the vulnerable adult and support person and they sign and approve also. The assessment tools provide a basis for supervisors to review with workers if the safety plans address assessed needs. Next slide, please. The final safety ass assessment assists in determining if case closure is appropriate based on current danger factors impact impacting the VA's current safety level. If the vulnerable adult is safe, the case may be closed. If the vulnerable adult is unsafe or conditionally safe, the case should remain open and review of the safety plan interventions and implementation for revision is needed. There are state policy and county discretionary overrides used to close the case when the vulnerable adult is conditionally safe or unsafe when certain conditions are met. Policy overrides include unable to implement services or safety plan for a vulnerable adult who can make informed decisions. Formal services responsible to implement the safety plan are in place to mitigate the risk. County discretionary overrides include there is an agreement in place to implement the safety plan by an informal support system to mitigate risk, or there is a court order denying petition for involuntary intervention, or there's potential harm of involuntary intervention outweighs benefit to the vulnerable adult. Both policy and discretionary overrides involve APS professional judgment. 
Again, these overrides are only used when all the criteria under which they can be used is met. The final safety assessment in any overrides used use provide another point for supervisor review at, for, of outcomes from APS interventions on the safety of the vulnerable adult. Next slide, please. In 2018, Minnesota was awarded a federal grant to enhance state adult protective services. Through the grant, in 2020, Minnesota contracted with a consulting company to evaluate the tool outcomes for statewide consistency and equity and service outcomes for vulnerable adults. The post-evaluation findings suggest that there is a significant statewide use of discretionary override among the total sample of the intake assessment tool completions analyzed. Over a third of all incoming APS case referrals are ultimately screened out on the basis of discretionary override. 41% of cases referred to county APS lead investigative agencies would be screened out when strictly following the decision-making logic used in the intake assessment tool. When discretionary override is applied, the statewide screen-out rate jumps from 41% to 76% of all cases being screened out. Data and free text entry analysis coupled with qualitative analysis using statewide stakeholder engagement from county APS agencies indicate that many county lead investigative agencies are not using the intake assessment tool as designed. And as a result, the tool is not the primary driver of screening decisions. Minnesota Department of Human Services is currently reviewing the findings and the post-evaluation recommendations provided by the consultants and will be holding presentations on the evaluation and recommendations to Minnesota County APS and stakeholders at a future date. The complete evaluation report of Adult Protective Services Standardized Intake Decision Tool is available on the Minnesota Department of Human Services Adult Protection Partners and Providers webpage. Next slide, please. If you'd like more information regarding the standardized tools used in Minnesota, our contact information is available on the screen. I would just like to say thank you, and I will now pass it on to Rachel. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel Lake, and I am the uh, administrator for uh, the state of New Hampshire for our Adult Protective Services Program. Um, I worked in APS for 22 years, uh, started as a social worker, and then a supervisor, and about 12 years ago, moved into this position as administrator. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and just to give you a little bit of um, just the landscape of New Hampshire, we are uh, a state-run APS program. All of our, um, all of our APS staff um, are state employees. Uh, we have 11 district offices uh, throughout the state. At the time that we started to look at using um, uh, these types of tools, we, um, we had 12 district offices. We now have 11. Um, we have uh, currently 37 field investigators. Uh, we, after as along about the same time as using standardized tools, we also developed a central intake and also a law was passed that we would have a, a, a central registry. Um, so at the time that we were looking at this, what we realized was that we had, you know, um, even though we're a small state and, you know, um, our numbers were relatively small in APS uh, for number of reports each year, um, or um, probably about average for, for our state size, but, but certainly smaller than some of the other jurisdictions out there. Um, but we realized that every office did things just a little bit differently, even though our supervisors all went to the same meetings every month. Um, and so um, it really began to kind of raise questions among us that, you know, why, why is this happening? And so we really delved into, you know, kind of what are the questions? Um, you know, what kinds of reports should be investigated? Uh, what type of report it is? Because sometimes there would be um, some of our supervisors that would say, Oh, this we would take this as emotional abuse, where somebody else might say, "Oh no, I would I would take this as neglect um, or that type of thing." Um, how urgent is the situation? Um, is the alleged victim safe? Um, will the case come back? And we had a lot of times we would have those discussions about, "Boy, this is unfounded, but they're going to be back." And um, you know, at that time we didn't really do much with cases that were unfounded. Um, 
And, um, you know, so as we started to implement standardized tools, we were able to kind of revisit that as to what we should be doing, even if the case is unfounded. Um, how do we develop a case plan? Um, when should I close the case? Um, how often should I see a client? I mean, we had um, an administrative rule that told us we should see um, any open protective case once a month. Well, you know, everybody's need is different in their situation and their risk is different. So probably we should have different uh, contact standards um, for different clients, depending on the situation. Next slide, please. So we were really looking at how can we, you know, provide consistency and, and uniformity in adult protective services. Um, you know, so if a, a report went into uh, office, again, at that time we hadn't formally transitioned to a centralized intake, but if a report had gone into our office up north, would it be handled the same way as if it went into an office in the southern part of the state? And we clearly knew that that probably wasn't happening at that time. We also saw it as a way of modernizing our, our program. Again, like I said, you know, we had limited ability to help um, in situations that were unfounded. Um, so we really wanted to correct that. Um, and that we thought also by using uh, standardized instruments that we would have uh, ability to really look at data and what is data telling us. And that we also thought it would be very useful in helping explain to the public um, and to other uh, people, funders, et cetera, um, of what APS is and, and how we go about doing our business. Next slide, please. So at the time we developed four assessment tools and, and they're very similar to what you just heard uh, Minnesota describe um, and how we um, implement them and what we use them for. Um, so we have our intake assessment, um, which really Helps, uh, helps guide us as to whether or not this should be uh, screened in uh, for a report, and then helps guide us as to how, how quickly should we respond to this report. In New Hampshire, we have, um, if a client is in what's uh, considered imminent danger, we have 24 hours to initiate our investigation. And if it's, a, if it's a something other than that, um, we would have 72 hours to initiate our investigation. And then we looked at safety. Um, and as we developed this tool, it was interesting because we did say, you know, um, what if somebody is not safe? Or what if maybe they're conditionally safe? Um, we got to do more than that. And so we did kind of develop the safety, uh, a safety plan as well with that tool. Um, and then um, we looked at risk. And this really looks at how, how likely is the person to be re-reported for maltreatment. And as you remember, I talked about those unfounded cases that in many cases we knew they were gonna come back to us. Um, and why, why did we just kind of wait for them to come back to us? That didn't really feel good to anybody. So how, you know, the risk really looked at how likely is this person um, going to be uh, you know, re-reported for maltreatment in the next six months. Um, and then we uh, looked at a strengths and needs assessment. Um, and I think the two components of the safety and the strengths and needs that are really important to understand too is that we not only look at our alleged victim, but if our alleged victim had what we call a primary support person or a caregiver, we also built into our tools, what if, what's going on with those folks? Um, because we, we recognize that if um, the caregiver um, had some safety issues going on or had some other issues going on, um, had some needs that weren't being met, that that was really going to impact our alleged victim as well. Um, and so the strengths and needs was really developed as a way to help guide us into, uh, you know, case planning you know, really recognizing what are the strengths here? What are the informal supports? What are the other supports that are in place? What, what strengths does a client have or their family have? Um, and then kind of what are their needs and identifying what those are and then kind of deciding what are, are um, you know, what needs really do we need to address in APS and, um, you know, kind of selecting those. Next slide, please. So some of the things that I think are important to bear in mind when you work with standardized tools is really what does the tool do for you? Um, so, you know, I think it has helped us to accomplish um, some consistency and some uniformity. Again, you have to kind of make sure that they're being implemented uh, correctly uh, by your staff. Um, it certainly helps with training and, and presentations. Um, 
And the tools that we developed, though, didn't help us with outcomes. So, you know, in New Hampshire, we have to, uh, we're a civil statute, so we have to, you know, make a founded determination based on a preponderance of evidence. Um, so, so in no way did these tools help tell us whether our report was founded or not founded. Um, and then what it also did not do is it really didn't tell us about, um, you know, whether or not the person was vulnerable, uh, whether or not that meant the cr guardianship criteria. Certainly, some of the some of the data in the tools might help with with deciding whether somebody uh, would need a guardian, um, depending on some of the outcomes. Um, it didn't help us talk about their cognition uh, in in any way, or assess their cognition, I should say. Um, and so we um, then uh, developed further tools to help us with you know, does this person meet the definition of vulnerability as it's defined in the New Hampshire Adult Protective Service Statute? And so we 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 kind of, you know, liked having <laughs> some standardized tools to, to use. Um, and so we developed, you know, a vulnerability, what we call an NCAP, uh, you know, a, a vulnerability tool at, at intake, which is um, a tool that uh, helps the intake staff determine whether or not the person meets that definition. Um, and it, it's a little bit broader um, than what we use in the field. The field has a different tool that they use. So on that first visit they go out, they use this uh, vulnerability tool because uh, as you probably know, and this is probably true in your jurisdictions too, if the person doesn't meet the criteria, we have no business furthering our investigation, conducting our investigation. And um, so that vulnerability tool becomes very important. Uh, to us and uh, making sure that, that we do determine that the person uh, meets that criteria. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about um, is just a little bit about how to use these tools in supervi supervision. Um, and I think um, there's a couple things that I would want to stress in this. Um, if you're using standardized tools, uh, whatever they may be, is that you want to make sure your staff is filling it out correctly. Um, and so, sometimes you think, well, there, there's the form and here's the directions to the form and here's the policy. Um, of course, of course, they're going to do it correctly, but um, you, you really want to make sure of that. And you kind of want to make sure that not only initially, but ongoing, that, that um, there's this term that uh, we use that happens sometimes is that there's this definitional drift that can sometimes happen. So I have the form, the form, you know, really doesn't have um, you know the definitions there or the policy behind it and and uh, talking about that types of things um, and so I think I know what is meant so I'm going to check no on this form when really I may have should might have should have checked yes because maybe if I went back and looked at the the policy and what this question is really trying to capture um, I would have checked yes in that in that situation um, so you you kind of I, I feel it's important to stay on top of that um, also, early on, um, I had a situation where somebody kept filling out the form and, and we would get these requests that, you know, the case is not going well. We might, might get that from a community provider or somebody else that knew we were involved and, and I'd start to look at things and all, all the time the safety came out as safe and I thought, this, this seems, this doesn't seem right. So I went back to the person and said, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, in this case and the safety comes out right, you know, it comes out as the person safe. And then, you know, in this case over here, the same thing. And like, I got these big eyes looking back at me and said, well, that's because they weren't safe when I was doing the assessment. So I, I went ahead and, you know, put the things in place that would make them safe. And then I filled out the assessment to reflect that they are now safe which was not the intention of the tool at all, of course. So, so it, you think you've trained people well, um, but just make sure you're checking in on that. I think the other thing that when I'm supervising a case that I like to look at is what came through the door in intake? Um, and as you know, that sometimes we get things that come through the door and they sound horrible. Um, and yet when we get out there, if they're not maybe as bad as they seem. We also get the opposite where it doesn't seem that bad and we get out there and it's, it's oh my goodness. Um, but so as I'm supervising a case and I'm, as I'm looking at these standardized tools, I'm always thinking, what did the reporter say? What was the concern that came in? And I'm trying to say, does, this, does the safety assessment, if it's coming out safe, 
does that make sense? Um, and um, if it doesn't, I'm going to ask the worker about that. Why, why does the safety assessment not come out safe? And sometimes it may be because they, in fact, did not fill out the form correctly, and that's that's okay. We, you know, we can work with that. We want to make sure that uh, people understand what they're doing, and that's not going to be punitive in any way. But let's let's have a discussion about this. Or what did you actually see? And they might say, you know, that's not, you know, they were not smoking while they were on oxygen. You know, they don't even they don't even have the oxygen anymore, or whatever the explanation might be. Um, but I want to make sure if I'm signing off on this tool as the supervisor, that the person has actually filled that form out correctly. And then if there is a discrepancy, that, if, that I understand that discrepancy and that it's, it's documented um, in the case notes as well. Um, so I think that's an important thing as a supervisor. Um, I think also, um, you know, and I know that, um, you know, that there are overrides in our system as well. Um, so if I'm overriding something, why am I really, why am I allowing for this override? Is it a policy override that, you know, because for instance, at intake, um, somebody might screen in as, you know, this is somebody we really need to go out and see immediately. However, they were taken to the hospital um, by ambulance and we knew that. So even though they came in and it looked like it was a level one at that instance, um, it, because they were taken to the hospital, I can comfortably say, yes, this discretionary or this policy override is, is appropriate in this case. Um, so again, I think it's really uh, very important to really kind of think about what these, what these instruments are telling you and just how does that make sense with what, what you know about the case or what was reported on the case. I think it's also important to understand that these are point in time um, documents and so that, you know, and I think that's the beauty of using standardized tools. And we use them a lot. We also, you know, use other things to help us uh, with determining whether somebody um, has cognitive decline or not. And so whatever standardized tool we're using, um, if, if it's a point in time, we can go back and do it again and say, boy, last, you know, two months ago, three months ago, they came out as safe or they came out as really no, no likelihood of cognitive impairment, but boy, something's different now three months later because now, uh, you know, the score looks very different. It's very concerning. And I think that's important to, to uh, you know, be able to, to think about as a supervisor when things are just not going the way you think they should, maybe we should go out and reassess, um, you know, and, um, and that may be well worth your time to do. Um, because it may it may save um, you know a bigger catastrophe later. Um, I talked about the risk assessment a little bit, um, and so that really does talk to us about you know how how likely is the person to be re-reported for maltreatment. Um, but it, so it it identifies those indicators that are present that we know that in New Hampshire this based on research that these are the indicators that are present that that. Um, say that the person's likely to be re-reported. Um, but um, it didn't really tell us how to mitigate those risks. Um, and so we then developed yet another tool that's called the Risk Identification and Mitigation, uh, excuse me, I'm gonna back up. It's called the Risk Identification and Mitigation Plan, which is a, a, a lengthier document um, that we use again a point in time. And it really kind of looks at those risks and what can you really do to mitigate this risk? Um, and, you know, there's some standardized things that you can check um, or you can put something else there too. But that's also very helpful um, to, as a supervisor to see that um, and see how that's coming out. Um, we, um, of course, we did change our practice in New Hampshire so that even if a case is unfounded, if they came out as moderate or high risk, we were gonna open the case and follow them. Um, and you know, one, one story that I can relate to you is that um, one time we had a, a person that was very high risk, he really needed to, to be seen medically. And I think he had refused the EMTs. Uh, the worker came back to the office pretty distraught, said there's not much else I can do, he's refusing help. And the supervisor looked at the tools and said, oh, boy, he's high risk. I, let's think about this a little bit more. And so she knew the gentleman liked popsicles. 
And so she said, I'm going to go visit him. And, and, you know, she just happened to, to have that availability to do that. He was pretty close by. And um, so she grabbed a popsicle, got one for herself, went over, they had a popsicle. And by the time they were through eating the popsicle, she was able to convince him to go to the hospital. And it was just that, that, you know, that looking at the tool, looking at the safety, looking at all those things, she thought, well, we just can't accept no here. We have to do something more. Um, so I think, um, I think those kinds of things can be helpful, um, you know, to review this and to think, okay, what are the tools really telling us and what can we do about it? And, and sometimes we have to, to say, well, okay, we, you know, we think they should do this and they're just not going to do it. But at other times it can help us to, to think about, well, what else can we be doing? Um, I'm going to stop there. We're going to turn it over to our next person. Persons. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maxine Stevenson with uh, Adult Protective Services, the Center for Learning and Organizational Excellence in Texas. And also I have with me today is Mr. Zach Tarver. Hi, everybody. I'm Zach Tarver. I work with Maxine uh, with Texas APS. I am a trainer developer or develop training. And uh, what I currently work on is rewriting uh, APS's supervisor training. And uh, Maxine and I are going to just kind of talk with you today from the standpoint of the standardized tools that we have and how the supervisors can utilize that information to move forward. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, so, like I said, we're going to review uh, some of the tools that the supervisors have access to. And these, the two tools that we're going to talk about today is our data warehouse and our quality assurance system. Um, Texas is a state-run uh, organization, and we have one computer system called Impact. And all of the information that APS uses goes into this system. Um, a lot of our standardized tools are identicals to the ones from the uh, previous presenters' uh, information as far as like safety assessment and those types of things. But again, we wanted to talk about what we do with that information. And so as the worker completes those tools, the information is captured by our data warehouse and our QA system. Um, one of the interesting things about our system is it's, uh, I guess, open source, if you will. Any employee can access any of the information in our data warehouse and QA system. And then that information can be viewed as broadly as you want, as like from a statewide level, or they can uh, filter it down to a district, uh, a county, a city, a unit, and a worker. Um, and then, so that's kind of how our presentation is going to go. So, Maxine, why don't you take over and talk about the data warehouse? Next slide, please. Thank you, Zach. So, as Zach mentioned before, the DFPS data warehouse is the official source for all impact data. So, everything that um, is typed into the impact system is captured by the data warehouse. So the data is recorded when the tools are completed by the staff. And supervisors, as Zach mentioned before, supervisors as well as staff can pull these reports from the data warehouse. Um, supervisors can use the information from the reports to identify um, trends within their units. They can identify trends across the state. Um, and they can just identify all these different trends and use this information to um, create action plans that assist with coaching and development of their staff. Um, there are numerous reports in the data warehouse, and I'm just going to name a few of those and kind of tell you all what those are. Um, some of the reports, or one of the reports, is the number of cases or pending cases. And so what we're looking at with this port report captures is the number of cases that are open within the month and how many cases are still open at the end of the month. Another one of the reports that we look at in the data warehouse or that can be used by supervisors are the number of cases that are in, in the investigation stage at the end of, of the month, as well as cases 
that are in service delivery stages. So the supervisor may be looking, okay, if it's an investigation stage, what services are being provided? Are those um, services working? Do they need to be modified? The same thing applies for cases that are in delivery stage or um, cases that are in service delivery. They also look at the validity rates of cases, um, rapid closures, which are an example of a rapid closure case would be cases that are unable to locate how many cases within your unified in your unit were closed as unable to locate. So those are just some of the cases that the supervisors use to identify the various trends and how they can develop staff. So um, the data helps to identify the policies and procedures that we need to reinforce better outcomes or better client outcomes. And we understand that the data can tell us what staff may be doing well, as well as what staff may not be doing well, but the data doesn't tell us the why. And so Zach is gonna be talking to you about the quality assurance piece of it. So next slide, please. Okay, so our quality assurance system consists of multiple different case reviewers. And what these staff do is they will read a sampling of closed cases for every worker under the APS umbrella. Um, and at a minimum, every unit in the state is read up to four times a year, and every staff is read at least eight times a year. Uh, these cases are closed cases, um, and the cases are reviewed for policy compliance, and then they're given an overall score rating. Um, as Maxine talked about, the data warehouse captures the information from the standardized tools that we do in IMPACT. Um, but QA can read for the context and the overall quality that our clients um, have received. For example, maybe the worker didn't speak to a doctor that could have given us some crucial information, or they missed uh, key questions in, intervie in interviewing um, an alleged perpetrator. Uh, the QA can look at, you know, did we solve the initial issues that the client came in with, or at least do the best that we can? Because not everything can be, you know, quantified by a button being pressed. And so that's uh, where our QA side comes in to kind of reinforce that data that's been gathered. And then from the supervisor point of view, they can review the reports to see what direction they need to go. Uh, kind of like Maxine said, they can look at it from their unit and down to the individual person. And so, for example, if they're looking at their unit and, you know, seven out of eight people are doing excellent in one measure, but you have one person that's not, then the supervisor can work with that individual to see what it is that they don't understand about policy. Or maybe the supervisor looks at it and their whole unit is kind of off on a certain uh, piece of quality assurance. Then they can reinforce that policy at a staff meeting and talk about how they're going to try to get better with that in the future um, to track those trends to make the progress. Um, and go to the next slide, please. And we also have uh, data analyst positions um, that assist the supervisors and managers as far as kind of filtering down all this data. Uh, because while we were only given a brief amount of time to talk, the amount of data that we have access to is really kind of overwhelming at first until you become used to it. And so these positions are really key to kind of help young supervisors kind of get a grip on what to focus on. and these individuals look at data from a higher level than one unit and so they can kind of help guide that supervisor as far as at least showing them what's out of line and like maxine said just because we see a number that's different it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad or good um, access to the information that we have doesn't tell us how to solve the issue but it just makes us aware of areas that need more attention and uh, having access to this level of information is key to our success. And I think that goes back to uh, kind of what Rachel was saying earlier, 
as far as staff maybe not filling out the assessments correctly and then going back to see that staff to figure out what it was exactly that you did so that we can fix it going forward. And that's really all that this information gives us. But having access to both um, the data and the quality assurance side helps us see the, the complete case. If you'll go to the next one, please. Um, like I said, I'm Zach Tarver. Uh, you heard Maxine, here's our information here. Um, you can always contact us if you have any sort of questions we'd be we'd love to answer and uh, that's the end of the texas session okay next slide please so we do have a couple of questions for you all um and we have several actually regarding requests for you all to share the tools um two of them just simply said are you able to share the tools and a third question request for the tools specifically asked for the quality assurance tools. So if all of each of you could please address that, how people can um, work with you to get a copy of the tools or if access is available. This is Rachel. If you just send me an email, I'll be happy to send you what we have. This is Melissa from Minnesota. Um, as Rachel just said, you can send um, us an email and request that information. Our tools and our policy um, regarding all the tools and their use are available on our webpage on the Minnesota Department of Human Services, um, Adult Protection Partners and Providers. But if you shoot over an email, I'd be happy to get you that link. And this is Zach. I would just echo what they said, uh, the Texas policies um, or online as well. Um, but if you have specific questions, we can send you more information about the tools that we have and um, how the quality assurance is read and things like that. But if you just contact us, we'll help you out. Thank you. And everyone's contact information is in the handout um, that was available to download, or if you aren't able to get that, just reach out to the TARC and we can make sure that you we put you in touch with all of them. Um, another question I have here um, is, I think it's probably for Melissa, because um, it came in about the time that you were presenting. How did you identify the situations that would justify the policy overrides, discretionary and policy overrides? And uh, I'll repeat it just um, for clarity. How did you identify the situations that would justify the discretionary and policy overrides? So I'm not exactly sure, because we do have a couple. Okay. Um, so we have, um, there's policy and discretionary override in um, the intake assessment tool, and then there is policy and discretionary override um, in the final safety assessment. Um, so looking at talking in regards to the intake assessment, um, we looked at the, the, how the intake tool is set up. It follows Minnesota policy and Minnesota statute. Um, and so for the policy overrides, only looking at um, just if it's duplicate reports, because as, as you all know, um, you can get multiple reports for the same vulnerable adult in the same situation from multiple reporters. Um, in Minnesota statute, uh, county agencies and all lead investigative agencies, we actually have three, we have the 87 counties, um, and then we have the Minnesota Department of Human Services Licensing Division and Minnesota Department of Health, um, which those two agencies are regulatory agencies and only investigate um, the allegations that involve facilities and, and programs that they license. So county is over everything else that is non-licensed. And in statute, counties and lead investigative agencies are allowed to have what are called prioritization guidelines to determine um, what they ultimately are going to accept or not accept for investigation. Um, and so looking at a commonality of often things um, that are used, such as 
the vulnerable adult is incarcerated, the vulnerable adult was deceased at the time the report was received, or just some examples, um, is what they kind of look at as discretionary. So that is, a dis, you know, at the discretion of the lead investigative agency of reason, though the tool is screening a report in for investigation or protective services, um, the agency ultimately is overriding that with a discretionary override to screen it out, stating um, why they would not um, accept that. The um, policy would say that it should be accepted. Okay, thank you for that. Another question that we have um, is how were the tools developed? Example developed by APS program staff based on existing validated tools, question mark. So this is Rachel. Um, in New Hampshire, we we contracted um, for someone to help initially, um, but some of the other things that I kind of refer to as our homegrown tools, uh, we did on our own. And normally what we did is we brought people together um, to, to do this. Um, we brought uh, people from the field, you know, the APSWs themselves uh, into, um, and we, you know, had a work group. Uh, we had supervisors there. Uh, we had administration participate. We had our policy people. Uh, we had our IT people participate. We had anybody that we thought was going to touch this tool in some way be at the table. And sometimes I, I felt bad for like the IT person because they sat through a lot of discussion that maybe they found interesting, but you know, <laughs> maybe wasn't wasn't too relevant at the moment for them. But but by doing that, um, I think it was very helpful because everybody knew exactly where we were going and why the final product looked the way that it did. And so I I just think it and then it also helped with buy-in from the staff, you know, that you know, because certainly when we started to look at this, we certainly had staff that said, you know, and, and in New Hampshire, we have a lot of longevity and we did back then too, that most of our attrition happens through retirement. So we had a lot of people saying, I've been doing this job for 20 years. I don't need a tool to tell me how to do this job. So that's how we brought people together. And um, we kind of, you know, had different people from different corners of the state that kind of would be then the ambassadors go back and talk with people about it, get their feedback, you know, because this was a process, this took a while to develop, get their feedback, they, then those people would come back to the group and say, this is what, you know, they're saying, you know, out in the western part of the state or whatever. So I thought that that was important. Um, but we, we kind of, you know, took some tools that were out there, you know, like DCYF had some tools, those kinds of things, and then we kind of made them for, a, you know, fit for APS, and then we also did what we called New Hampshireize it, you know, so how does it really fit to our law, our rules, those types of things. Any of the other presenters like to speak to that question of how your tools were oh. developed? Yes, ma'am. So this is Maxine with Texas. It's similar to what Rachel said. We contracted an agency and we adopted those tools. We wanted to make sure that um, exactly what Rachel said in her presentation, if you were receiving services in Houston or Austin or anywhere across the state, that it was consistency in the way that you received those services. But we did use a um, agency that was contracted and we adopted those tools and we now look at the safety of the client, um, whether or not the cases are valid based upon the risk level of the client. And also we do what's called that strengths and needs assessment, which looks at the strengths of the client as well as the strengths of the care, um, the caregiver. And we're able to provide services to the caregiver based upon that information. So we did adopt our tools from someone else, or contract it from someone else. In Minnesota, um, in 2009, um, a Minnesota Adult Protection County Collaborative was formed um, with six counties coming together and working um, with a vendor to customize and implement um, the tools. Okay, thank you all for that. I appreciate it. And then there's one final question, and I want to say it's for um, Rachel because it's regarding the vulnerability tool you mentioned. Sure. Sure. Yep. 
Okay, for clarification, if you go out and the vulnerability tool indicates that the person doesn't meet the definition, are the other tools then not used at all? Is that what that, you your case? That's correct. Now, we don't go out and say, oh, sorry, you're not us, see you later. Um, we we do not, you know, we do not do the safety um, thing. I, I, we don't do the risk, uh, you know, we just, we have no authority to continue an investigation, but we do address why we were brought out there and, and talk with the client and say, you know, um, we understand these things are going on um, and they may or may not be going on. The client may say, yes, they are, or no, they're not. But if they are, these are, these are you know, we're gonna leave them with resources of where they can get help. Um, so uh, yeah, we we have to kind of cease and desist at that moment with a formal investigation. But we are going to talk with them and, and try to help them for sure. Excellent. So that is actually all the questions. Oh no, one more just popped up. I apologize. Uh, does your APS agency have both investigators and case managers, or do investigators also provide? case management this question is for everyone again does your APS agency have both investigators and case managers or do investigators also provide case management so, so this is Maxine oh go ahead I'm sorry you want go ahead Maxine yeah okay so this is Maxine in Texas our um, caseworkers they provide they do the investigation as well as provide services and that's true in New Hampshire as well. They they do both. They do the investigation, and then if we need to open the case and and provide case management, uh, it's it's normally going to be the same worker that does that. In Minnesota, that it varies by county agency. Okay. Well, that was quick. Um, it looks like that now is our uh, last question. I wanna thank all of our presenters. Could you go to the next, oh, there you go. Next slide, please. Um, this is the information for the APS TARC if you'd like to reach out to us. Again, if you um, don't are unable to get a copy of the handout downloaded and would like to reach out to our presenters, please just email the APS TARC at this email address and we will make sure to give you their contact information. I want to thank all of you today for a very informative and helpful uh, presentation. I appreciated it. And I am going to give everybody two minutes of their day back. So everyone have a great and wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much.